Well, what does make biblical counseling biblical? I'll tell you, my friend. Biblical counseling is biblical because it relies on the Holy Spirit to enable the change of putting to death the deeds of the flesh. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Biblical counseling is biblical because the homework that we give our counselees each week is from the Word of God. What makes biblical counseling biblical? When we're sitting across from a person who's struggling with the issues of life, we're communicating the truth of God by exhorting and preaching the Word with the authority it demands. What makes biblical counseling biblical? It's based on an, a theologically accurate bibliology. What makes biblical counseling biblical? I'll tell you, biblical counseling is biblical because the end result is God having changed a human life through the power of his word and his sufficient grace. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Biblical counseling is biblical because the mission of the counselor is to emulate the love of Jesus Christ in the relationship with the counselee. What makes biblical counseling biblical? I'll tell you, my friend. Biblical counseling is biblical because the end of a case where the counselee's response to the word is negative, I don't believe that, I'm not going to do that, is a warning. For the Christian, it's a warning from Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. You're inviting God's discipline. My friend, you are asking God, can you knock me down? And the answer to that question is yes. And when he does, it will hurt. But he will do it because he loves you. And somewhere amid the pain, you'll come to your senses and repent. And you'll be walking with God again. For the unbeliever, it's Romans 1, 18 to 32. It's the warning that one more time, you've heard the truth of the gospel and you're turning away. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Biblical counseling is biblical because the purpose of the counselor and the purpose at the end for the counselee is to do all things to the glory of God. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Biblical counseling is biblical because it exalts the word of God as the eternal truth. Biblical counseling is biblical because it exalts God as all-wise and all-powerful and his glory as the reason for living. Biblical counseling is biblical because in the cases with the most severe human problems, the answer is always the same. What does the Bible say about that? Biblical counseling is biblical because we believe that the Bible is sufficient for every need of every believer. So if your purpose is to offer accurate counsel from God's word to the struggling people who come across your path in your life, then biblical counseling is what you're looking for. May God strengthen each of us to have a high view of his word as we consider our own lives, our own circumstances, our own choices, and also as we provide answers to life questions for our counselees and the people we disciple. Well, we're going to take a look at some other answers to the question, what makes biblical counseling biblical during our time? That was my introduction. Let's take a look at Roman numeral two. What makes biblical counseling biblical? A theologically accurate bibliology is its foundation. Uh, point A, the inspiration and origin of the scriptures. Here is the truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That identifies the source of counsel that we need to give ourselves and that we need to give to the people God brings across our path. 
So the words and ideas of Scripture emanated from within the very being of God. This elevates the Bible to a whole different level than, than any other source of potential truth. The Scriptures also, also state the following. 2 Peter 1, verses tw one, uh, 20 and 21. There we go. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Therefore, the word of God did not come from the will or the mind of man, but from God himself. Here are the applications in biblical counseling for these truths about the inspiration and origin of the scriptures. Since these things are true... The word must be the final source of all counsel given to God's children. No teachings of man can claim to originate from God in the same way. And further, because of their origins, only the scriptures can be trusted and revered as true and as authoritative. Because of these truths of bibliology... It is not accurate to say that biblical counseling is a counseling model that uses the Bible to accomplish its purposes. Rather, it should be said that biblical counseling determines its purposes by the content of God's Word. In other words, the authority in biblical counseling is not what men write and think. The essence of biblical counseling is this. Communicating the Bible and theologically sound and accurate applications of the Bible. Let's look at point B in this section. The authority of the scriptures. Here's the truth. The authority of the Bible is communicated in many ways. Foremost are the claims within the scriptures that they originate from the Almighty God. We looked at those in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Also, Jesus and the New Testament writers regarded the Old Testament as the holy word of God. We see that in the references in front of you. Similarly, New Testament writers viewed their own inspired writings and those of each other as the word of God. As an example, 2 Peter 3.16. Of course, also the accuracy and fulfillment of the prophecies in the Bible also verify its authenticity. So the truth of the authority of the scriptures. What are the applications of these important facts in the biblical counseling room? The Bible has ultimate authority over all matters it addresses. Wayne Grudem, in his systematic theology, accurately explains it this way. Quote, The authority of Scripture means that all the words in Scripture are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve or disobey any word of Scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God. End of quote. The authority of God's word makes it the source for all good counsel. Since we can know the words of God, the, philosoph the philosophies of man are rendered inconsequential. In the biblical counseling room, the source of truth is scripture. The content of counsel is God's word. Therefore, the counselor must proclaim God's word with the authority it demands. Roman numeral three, accurate counsel from the Bible. This is our part. This is the part that takes hard work and good research and good data gathering with our counselees. But what makes biblical counseling biblical is when the counselor is communicating the word in an accurate and pertinent way. Letter A under point three. Obeying Scripture determines the effects of adversity. 
Here's the truth. Matthew 7, verses 24 to 29, Jesus speaking. He said, quote, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority, not as their scribes. What are the applications of Matthew 7, 24 to 29 in biblical counseling? First, hard times reveal life's foundation. This passage is so pertinent because so many people who come to you and ask for help in biblical counseling are in the middle of the storm. They can relate to what Jesus was talking about. Their life feels like it might feel in here if there was a torrential downpour and maybe hurricane force winds going on and maybe a window or two blown out. The rain is coming down. We're in the middle of the storm. What's going to happen? And that's how life feels. What's going to be the outcome? Is the house still going to be standing? Or is it going to be obliterated by the rising waves outside? Hard times reveal life's foundation. And a Christian's response to the word influences greatly the impact of trials. Is that an understatement or what? Because what Jesus tells us there is the, the differences of the two roads, the two foundations. The reaction to his word The person who hears it and acts upon it, the house is still standing at the end. It's as strong as it ever was. It's not stronger, but for the person living in the house, they're more confident in the house, aren't they? So there's there's the one option. And the other one is, man, it's it's like those, uh, it's like the video that we see on the 11 o'clock news when, uh, you know, some big storm came in and the house is facing the wrong way in Malibu, just got obliterated by 14-foot waves. Um, So the response to the word for this person who's come to you for help will determine whether at the end of the storm they're standing stronger and more confident than ever or the metaphorical house that is their life is obliterated. Many Christians over the years have sought counsel at Valley Bible Counseling Center at my church in Lancaster. And many of those people, the reason they sought that help was they were in the middle of the storm and they they weren't sure what was going to happen and they were afraid. They wanted help at the most severe time in their life. The troubles were significant. All the different things. Sometimes a, a spouse passed away unexpectedly. Somebody lost a career type job. Um, school was diff- difficult. Uh, a traumatic failure, upcoming surgery, no friends, many others. So biblical counselor, when, when you're meeting with people at those times in life, what do you tell them? Do your part to study the word diligently and to gather good information so that you can communicate accurately the truth of God word, God's word as it applies to them in their circumstances that day. One of my counselees had lost a significant job. Months went by, and he had to start over in a different field of work, so entry level, much less pay. He was in the middle of the storm. He didn't know how to handle it. He didn't know how it was going to turn out, and so that's why he picked up the phone and called the church office and said, I need to talk to someone. Well, Matthew 7, 24 to 29 provided vital truth for him. 
he had a choice. And that choice involved how he would respond to God's word. God was very interested in what choice he made. In that particular case, the core of it all was Matthew 6, 25 to 34. And it had two significant implications. In that passage, Jesus taught to not be anxious over life on earth. And he said to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. With this particular man, we'll call him Chris, he had often viewed his success in the business place and his wealth as completely his own doing. And so one of his biggest fears was he was going to lose a lot of this stuff that he had accumulated. Also, in that career that ended, he did not work as a man seeking God's righteousness. Rather, he competed with co-workers and he did whatever he needed to do to surpass them. So for Chris, acting upon Jesus' words in Matthew 6, we required acknowledging God's sovereignty and not worrying about the things that he might lose. It also required him to be thankful to do the good, humble work of an entry-level guy for the purpose of bringing glory and honor to God, as opposed to competing with all these other people so that he can get promoted sooner. The choices he would make would have huge consequences because he was in the middle of the storm. He heard the words of Christ. Was he going to act upon them and have the outcome of the storm be his house standing, his life still standing? Or was he going to not act upon the words of Christ, want the things he had wanted, live the way he had lived, work the way he had worked, and his house would be obliterated by this storm. That, that, that was really the choice. All of that was hanging in the balance. Well, fortunately, Chris repented of his sins, and he did replace anxiety with honoring God. He got to the point where he chose to work for God's glory alone, and he was willing to accept whatever accumulation of wealth and things uh, fell by the wayside. So as he was this uh, humble man doing his work for the sake of God's glory, making less than half of what he used to in this entry-level position in the new field, he would review Matthew 7, 24 to 29 every day, and he, he was comforted. Because no matter the severity or the duration of his tribulation, at the end, he would be standing. And he would be standing with God and standing on the promises and truths of God's word. That was exciting. And that's what happened. That's how it turned out for Chris. His adventure and the ultimate obedience to Matthew 7, 24 to 29, demonstrate the sufficiency of God's word for a person who's suffering through adversity. Well, Roman numeral three, letter B, another important truth about the scriptures is this. The Bible's unique incision into the soul. Here's the truth. Consider Hebrews 4, 12 and 13. For the word of God is active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Powerful passage. Application in biblical counseling. The word of God is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
that tells us that this one thing, the word of God, is his instrument to judge the hearts of men. We know from Proverbs that God critiques our purposes. In Proverbs 16, 2, it says, the Lord weighs the motives. And in Proverbs 17, 2, it says, the Lord tests hearts. So we see the role of the word in this process in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. The word exposes the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, only God can fully know hearts. I think that often people don't even realize their own purposes clearly, but God certainly does. He knows exactly why you and I do each thing that we do. But in a biblical counseling case, where our purpose is inner person change, where the end game is a heart that is driven by obedience to God, interaction at the heart level is absolutely vital. If we can facilitate our counselee interfacing with God's word at the deepest level of the soul, God will expose the counselee's motives. It's a fact. How can it not be? The Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 tells us that. And God will communicate, he will reveal to the counselee his judgment of the desires that he's finding in the heart. If the counselee is willing to talk about that encounter with God or write about that encounter with God, then we will be able to counsel from the scriptures most effectively because we'll understand those thoughts and intentions, the motives of the heart that God has revealed to his child. So God exposes and judges the believer's heart. That's what it says in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. Look at the description of God's exposing and judging the believer's heart in verse 13. The NASB reads, All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The ESB says, All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The latter is really more literal. There's a sense of authority in the Greek words, and the literal words are naked and grabbed by the throat. <laughs> Somebody pictured that. Okay. Well, linguists who study the word say that this may be a reference to a wrestling move that leaves the person limp and powerless or some position where the person is completely subdued and they can't get free. So when you think about the culture of the Roman world to whom this is written, most police officers in those cities were retired veterans of war. And they were regarded as heroes, kind of like retired veterans of war in this country, say, in the 1940s. So we have this picture of what happens when God exposes the motives of the heart. It's like the, the 6'4", 240-pound police officer engages you in a public place, he's tackled you down, and he's got you in this position where you, you can't move. And perhaps you have one of those dress-like things, and it's like uh, not covering everything, too, based on that other word. So it's humiliating. And you're completely helpless. This guy's knee is in your chest, and you're gasping for air, and you can't move your arms or your legs. It's quite a graphic image. If you and I are paying attention every day when we spend our time in the Word, we know what this is like. God exposes the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And that gives us a choice. What do we do then? Do we repent of sins that are exposed? Do we give thanks for the good things that He's showing us that exist in our motives? Do we seek his help through his grace and through the word to replace those sins with righteousness? Those are humbling times. The times that God exposes 
the thoughts and intentions of my heart and there's evil involved there, I, I hate myself then. I, it's, uh, um, it's difficult. Personally, I think that if God revealed everything evil that he saw in me all at once, I think I would die. I think that would be too much at once. But God sovereignly, because of his holiness and because of his love, when we're paying attention in our time in the word, he reveals some of it. And he gives us this opportunity. There we are helpless, like the guard with his knee in our chest, and we can't move. But what do we do? What do we do? If we repent of our sin, and if we seek his sufficient grace to be doers of the word, then there's a great result of that somewhere down the road as he enables us to put to death those deeds of the flesh that are so humiliating at that moment. We need those times with the Lord. They're painful at the moment, but they're beautiful in the end. How could we live without them? We realize who God is and who we are, and we see the purpose of life very clearly. Lord, I will subject my will to yours. Lord, I repent of this sin. Lord, I will strive to obey your word. Father, will you strengthen me to be a doer of the word in this area of my life? Our counselees need these times with God as well. Because these interactions with God are the core of change. On the top of page 101, there's a question. How can we use the scriptures to give our counselees the best opportunities to have these kinds of meetings with God? There's a vital component to discipleship or biblical counseling here. Because if we can somehow... If we can somehow facilitate this kind of interaction between our counselee and the Lord, then true change can occur. And if what goes on there is submission to God's word and the commitment to obeying him, the result will be great. No storm can touch your counselee if that's the result. So here are some answers for consideration. How can we use the scriptures to give our counselees the best opportunity to have these meetings with God. One, the scriptures must be the focal point of your biblical counseling. Me telling people like how my mom did things isn't going to help them. <laughs> hey, my mom was a nice lady, okay? Come on. <laughs> but really, no, that's not going to help. All right. Number two, when you prepare to teach a strategic passage from God's word for an upcoming counseling session, here's a suggestion. Carefully compose two precise questions that will force your counselee to consider the passage at the heart level with God. God will be doing his part, you can be sure. They might ignore him, but he will be judging the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Then, carefully word a third question to ask the counselee to share the results of God's exposing of his heart. He can choose not to answer that question, but if he does, then you have a great opportunity. A great opportunity to counsel from the scriptures at the deepest level of the soul. Number three, craft homework that forces your counselee to consider the scriptures that address his area of sin at the inner person level, and then ask him to write about it. Four, convince your counselee that your purposes are God's glory and your counselee's benefit. I think that's an important aspect of trust in this relationship. Five, convince your counselee that you love him with a Christ-like love. And number six, be patient. Your part in all of this, what's going on between this soul of your counselee or your disciplee and the Lord, your part in all of it is a careful interaction with God and with that person. But what a privilege to be involved in such a ministry. And what a joy it is when you see God doing what you know he will, and then that Christian brother or sister responding, and then change occurs, and it's change that, that, that starts at that core level. 
as Ernie was talking about in the last hour. Wow, what a joy. Roman numeral 3.C, God's generous provisions in regard to his use of the word. This passage of great hope and loving provision is the powerful conclusion for the person whose heart was exposed in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13 and who responded by repenting of sin. Here it is, a few verses later, Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here are the applications in biblical counseling. If after God has exposed my motives and my sins by the active use of his word, if at that point my desire is to replace sin with righteousness, then this passage, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, is a cause for rejoicing. Look what it says. It says that Jesus Christ, my Lord, understands. He's been tempted in every way, just like me, yet without sin. Since he is in me and I am in him, since the theology of the union with Christ is true, the scriptures teach that, this union with Christ, he is in me and I am in him, that tells me that this sin can be overcome regardless of its frequency or its severity. That is, that is powerful hope. We have that. Our counselees must have that. And then in verse 16, God is telling me to confidently ask for the two things that I really need at that point, his grace and his mercy. His grace, which is really a synonym for help, is exactly what I need if I'm going to keep the door closed to this sin and not go back to it again. I need his help. And he's telling me to ask confidently for that help. How kind is the Lord. And I also need his mercy. I, as a Christian, I was not in danger of losing my salvation. But as a Christian, I was inviting God's discipline with my sin of uh, frequency or severity. But now I've repented. I've intentionally purposed to not sin in this way again. I've turned from pursuing that sin to pursuing obeying the word. And so I can be assured that I'm re restored to him completely. And therefore, I am not in danger of discipline. How kind is the Lord? So if your counselee is interacting with God in his word at the level described in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, he needs to know the great hope of Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. And so our part is communicate those things clearly. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Well, Roman numeral 4 on page 102 gives us another topic. The Bible's teaching on relationships is the counselor's code of conduct. The quote that you have is from a book called Counseling by John MacArthur. And one of the chapters that Wayne Mack wrote is called Developing a Helping Relationship with Counselees. And so he gives us a 10-point synopsis of how to demonstrate genuine compassion for your counselees. Wayne Mack is, uh, was a longtime board member of the National Association of Nuthetic Counselors. He's now an academy member. He lives in South Africa where he has a flourishing ministry of biblical counseling and, and pastoral training. Um, and one of his frequent topics that he taught about and wrote about was this kind of relationship between the counselor and the counselee. So here, here are the 10 points he lists with the scriptures that he lists in that book. Philippians 1.8, tell your counselee you care for them. Colossians 4.12 and 13, pray for them and with them. Romans 12.15, rejoice with them and grieve with them. Matthew 12.20, deal with them gently and tenderly. 
Proverbs 15, 23, be tactful or timely with your words. Colossians 4, 6, speak to them with grace. Mark 10, 21, love and accept them even when they have rejected your counsel. That's an interesting one. Take a look at Mark 10, 21. Matthew 12, 1 through 7, defend them against those who mistreat and accuse them. That's real care. Matthew 18, 21 and 22, forgive them of any wrong they have done to you. And 1 John 3, 17, if you are able and there is need, meet their physical needs. It is a privilege for us as biblical counselors to serve our fellow Christians by striving to emulate Christ's love. What makes biblical counseling biblical? Roman numeral 5, middle of page 102 on your conference notes. In this section, some of the words that I say are found in your notes and some are not, but I am going to go in order. So I hope you can uh, stick with the same uh, general flow that I'm going with. In this section, we're going to examine other essential truths of bibliology. The first of these essentials essential truths is the Bible's authority in regard to theological controversies. The truth is, John 17, 17, God's word is truth. And Psalm 119, 89, his word is also eternal. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So the application in biblical counseling. What, um, what theological controversies are there in our world today, in our Christian culture? There are really two categories. Some theological controversies are debates over doctrines of the Bible between Christians and unbelievers. There are lots of these because there are lots of churches that don't teach the gospel. So these debates include distortions of the gospel and other misrepresentations of the Bible by cults and by false religions. In regard to these theological controversies, we must stand for the truth of the word, the authority of the scriptures, and the integrity of the gospel in our time. We must appeal to the clear truths of the word to oppose any heretical use of the Bible. There's another kind of theological controversy that we run into in our time, and that is differing views held by Christians who each use the Bible as their authority. So some examples from this category are different beliefs about end times events or the value of affiliating with a denomination or not for the local church. Regarding theological controversies among ourselves or between us and other true Christians, such as the examples just named, we each should respectfully uh, present our own reasoning from the scriptures and listen with respect to the other side. And then we each should decide what we believe is true from God's word and how the word applies to that issue in our own life in church. There's another area of um, this uh, general category, and that is general revelation versus special revelation. That's at the top of page 103. The doctrine of general revelation, as unfolded in Scripture, shows that God uses creation and the conscience of man to disclose particular facts about himself. Let's think this one through. Romans 1, 19 to 21 says this, quote, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. So there's a biblical definition of general revelation and the purposes for it. 
the applications in biblical counseling, every person who ever lived has understood enough about God that they could make choices about honoring him or not. We just read that. Scripture also teaches that God disseminates truth of general, general revelation to man through nature, Psalm 19, 1 through 6, and through the conscience, Romans 2, 14 and 15. So whether, whether people acknowledge it or not, everyone knows or has known the facts about God that he has disclosed through general revelation. Why is that important? Because general revelation is described in the scripture with a particular purpose. It's something that's common to every per person, and the purpose is for giving people the opportunity to seek God. And it holds them accountable if they do not seek God. That's what it says in Romans 1, 19 and 20. Ironically, in our time, some people use that term general revelation as a justification for using a source other than the scriptures as truth for counseling people struggling with life issues. People who propose to take truth from the Bible and truth from all of the secular counselors in the last 150 years say that that is general revelation. That is God revealing truth, just like he revealed truth in the Bible. And so we could use both of those to counsel people. That's different because when, an, when a professing unbeliever comes up with a counseling system and they're telling you uh, to use this in counseling people at the crossroads of life, but it is not in conformity with what the Bible is saying about that, that's neither the identity of general revelation nor is it the purpose of general revelation. The purpose of general revelation is to convict people of sin and to reveal enough truth through creation and through their conscience that they could seek God. There's also special revelation. Special revelation occurs only through the Bible. The essence of special revelation is its focus on the purpose and propitiatory work of Jesus Christ. Through special revelation, that is to say by God's word, every elected person in the church age comes to salvation, according to 1 Peter 1, 22 to 25. Special revelation is also God's chosen vehicle for the progressive sanctification of scripture. I mean of Christians, excuse me. So understanding that the Bible is God's means for revealing truth in our time is also an important foundation of biblical counseling. So I bring these, uh, these two points of theology for your consideration because you'll probably hear them used in different ways than, uh, than how the scriptures reveal uh, the truth about the topics they encompass. So Roman numeral six, our conclusion. What makes biblical counseling biblical? I'll tell you. Biblical counseling is biblical because its purpose is to honor and glorify God. By accurately following the truths of God's eternal word and only those truths in every aspect of the counseling process, including but not limited to the purpose of counseling, our view of God, our view of man, our analysis of the problem, our source of counsel, our source of truth, the definition of the solution, the means of change, the guide for communication, and the guide for relationships within the counseling ministry. The word of God is adequate for each of these things. God tells us that his word is his instrument to equip us in each of these things, in our own lives and in our ministry to others. May God strengthen each of us to counsel accurately from his word in discipleship relationships, in informal counseling conversations, and in the formal counseling setting.